Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to contemplate for ourselves this morning is found recorded for us in the Gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 16, let me highlight for you verses 13 through 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But you, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thus far, God's word lets you and I continue with prayer. Merciful Father, what a joy it is to be able to gather together to give you worship and praise, to hear of your grace and mercy as found in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Help us to grasp this marvel of Jesus, that he is your Son, yes, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. <clears throat> if you're like me, you would recognize that this text presents, I think, a rather interesting challenge. It's a challenge not only because of the truly remarkable confession of Jesus that's presented in this text, but I think it's also a challenge because of the question that is raised that brought about this confession. Now, what do I mean? Well, here is Jesus asking his disciples what people thought about him. Now, if, if, if you don't think any further than that, you simply figure that Jesus was just truly being human. I mean, that's a truly human thing for Jesus to do, isn't it? Jesus wanted to know, like most of us want to know, what other people thought about him. And again, we think, well, how truly human on Jesus' part. Yet, we want to dig a little deeper. So I want you to ask this question. Since Jesus is the Son of God, shouldn't he have known what people thought of him? I, I think that's an interesting question, because in contemplating that particular question, then it's the reality and the wonder of what's going on it, that it actually hits you. Because then you have to conclude, G Jesus wasn't asking for himself. Jesus wasn't just being human. Jesus is actually serving as our Lord and Savior. Jesus is working to bring souls to the wonder and marvel of God's gracious love. So let's, let's just go ahead and let's answer that question. Did Jesus no. The answer, dear people, is a resounding yes. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. He is the all-knowing God. And even in his state of humiliation, when Jesus does not have the full use of his heavenly power and glory, I think we can still be assured that Jesus knew the answer. Jesus knew what people thought of him. Jesus knew what even the disciples thought of him. Let that sink in. Jesus knew. See, that leads you then to ask, well, then why did he ask the question? Because sometimes when answering a question, one must consider the reason. One has to consider the motivation behind that question. And again, Jesus was not out to bring glory and honor to himself. Jesus is working to help his disciples. Jesus wants to strengthen and increase their knowledge and their understanding. This question, all the questions that are asked here, are designed to make the disciples think. These questions were asked for the disciples' own good and faith. And all of this is clearly seen when you understand the history that's behind this event. So let you and I contemplate this question of Jesus for ourselves, and we're going to do so under this theme. Who do you say I am? And what I think is important for us to grasp when it comes down to this particular text is the general history that's behind it. Jesus has been involved in his ministry for about two years and some odd months at this particular time. 
have to understand he's had a first great year. Well, really, we call that first year, not quite a year, but we call it the year of inauguration. That's when people began to hear about Jesus. He started his ministry. They heard about his miracles, and the bottom line is people were flocking, flocking out to see Jesus. That year of inauguration eventually grew into what we call the year of popularity, but actually that year of popularity was probably 14 to 16 months long. You need to understand, we're, we're at the end of that period. We're at the end of the year of popularity and beginning the next year. And the next year, you have to understand, is going to be different. And it's already kind of started in the sense that already Jesus' popularity is beginning to fade. So typically, the third year of the ministry of Jesus is known as the year of opposition. You have to understand that this year happens because the Jewish religious leadership has, by this time, now managed to get the people to abandon Jesus, to abandon the idea that Jesus is the Messiah. And actually, they've convinced the people now that Jesus is a false Messiah. And they managed to do this because, and they did this because Jesus did not fit, did not fit what they thought the Messiah should be. You have to understand, as, as Jewish people, they had been taught that the Messiah was going to be an, a worldly ruler, that the Messiah was going to use them, the, the Jewish people, especially the rulers and leaders as, as the heart and core of his kingdom. They would be rulers and leaders in the Messiah's kingdoms. And they were not concerned at all with any kind of spiritual message or anything to do with forgiveness of sins and salvation because, frankly, when you look at these people, you understand that these religious leaders, these Jewish people, in many cases, thought that they were holy and perfect on their own and they didn't really need a, a spiritual Savior. Jesus, Jesus called them sinners. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, a brood of vipers, blind fools, and hypocrites. So they hated Jesus. And they hated what he was all about. And they did everything they could, in every way they could, to undermine and destroy Jesus and his work, including turning to people against Jesus. This question that Jesus asked of his disciples is asked at the beginning of that year of opposition. Jesus wanted his disciples to think about what the people were saying. Now again, remember, these people have been led astray by the false religious leadership of their day. So it's clear these people had all, all sorts of foolish ideas concerning Jesus. Jesus wants his disciples to think about all of this. Think about that. Think about what the world was saying. And then he wants them to later on answer the question about what they thought of Jesus. And, and by the way, you need to understand this. The disciples basically spent their entire time with Jesus. And I'm pretty sure that if anything, anything at all had come up that would show that Jesus was not what they confessed here, they wouldn't have made the confession. So it starts with the people. So, who do people say the Son of Man is? What is the world stating about Jesus? And the answer the disciples give, based on what the people were saying, is some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. I, I have to be honest with you and tell you, I, I find the answer of these people, what the people were saying, to be just a bit disturbing. Because actually when you look at their answers, you realize that their answers contain more superstition and more paganism than it actually contains the word of God. And these were the Jewish people. They should have known the word of God. Because the answer that they think Jesus some sort of reincarnated John the Baptist. Really? Jesus was baptized by John. Those two men walked this earth together, and in that matter, they were related to each other. They're actually six months apart in age. So all you got to do is ask, how could two contemporary men be the same man? And you realize the utter, utter silliness of that way of thinking. Well, the fact that they say, some say Jesus is Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets, 
You have to understand the Bible never, never speaks of some sort of reincarnation. Never speaks about us coming back as, as another person. Rather, the Bible tells us that we have one life to live, only one life to live, and then, dear people, it's judgment time for us. So their answers, their answers are the answers of, of a people who do not know what God's word says, people who, if you would, believe half-truths and lies and falsehoods, and they pass it off as fact. So when you think about the silliness of, of what people thought of Jesus, I think that should serve as a, a good warning for you and I. Because I, I, I don't want you to ever think that, oh, well, we're, we're too smart to do anything like that today. But dear people, today on a regular basis, people deny the truth of Jesus. To them, Jesus is really only a great teacher. Jesus is someone who came to show us how to live and how to best please God with our works. Or people teach that Jesus is just some guy who came to show us how to stand up against the man, to stand against authority and, and those who would lord it over us. There are those people who want to use Jesus as simply the, the great teacher of, of social equality and justice. I mean, all you have to do is listen to what the world is saying out there to, to realize these things today. People who reject that Jesus died for our sins. People, and I'm, I'm sometimes talking about churches, Christian churches, that deny that Jesus rose from the dead or that Jesus even lives and rules with God now over all of us. But you just need to, to listen to the world. You just need to listen to that. And I want you to do that so you can listen to your own confession, the truth of Jesus, and, and become, make sure that that truth of Jesus becomes all the more precious to you. So, so I'm going to tell you, it, it's really quite a relief to hear the answer of the disciples to Jesus' next question. But you, who do you say I am? Now you have to understand, Peter is simply the spokesman for all the disciples here. Peter was the, the brassier one, and Peter speaks up first. But Peter is basically making confession for all the disciples. In other words, all the disciples agree with this statement. And what do they say? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And how right these words are. Jesus is the Christ. He is the promised Savior, the Son of God, that God's word foretold. He is the one who came to be the atoning sacrifice for sin. He is the one who came and by his life, his suffering, and his death, he defeats sin, death, and the devil on our behalf. He is the one who came to declare all people, all people from every nation are the children of God and heirs of eternal life simply because they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is the one. He is the only one who fulfills all the promises of God concerning our souls and concerning the Messiah to come. So yes, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you grasp how important that confession is even, even for today? Because if all, you, if all you think about Jesus or if all you say about Jesus is that he's some, somebody who showed us how to live right, well then, dear people, how is that different from any other religious person or any other religion of the world that proclaims that salvation is by works and then begins to tell you how you have to do this or do that in order to earn salvation or life or whatever it is they're promising fact is, if Jesus is anything short of what he proclaimed and what he reveals of himself in your heart, then I have to tell you point blank that you do not grasp, you do not understand the true and real Jesus of God's word. And then I want you to note this. Jesus accepts this confession as true. Jesus proclaims this confession is true, and even more yet, Jesus says this. It's very pointed, isn't it? Jesus tells his disciples, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
So now we recognize, in, in, in truth, the, the whole of God's word rests on this confession. Jesus is the Christ. It, if these words are not true, dear people, then nothing in the Bible is true. Because he is the one who would be as Moses, only greater. He would be the descendant of Abraham, a son of David, and yet David's Lord. He would be the sin bearer, the propitiation, the mediator of the mercy of God. He would be the bearer of righteousness, the Holy One, the Lamb to be slaughtered on account of the wrath and anger of God against sin. The Christ would be the revealer of God, the light of the world the one to die, and yet the one who would live forever. He would be God's prophet, our forever high priest, and the king enthroned forever. He would be hated without cause. He would be put to death with sinners. His hands and his feet and his side would be pierced. He would be hung on a tree and buried with the rich. But most important, Everything connected to salvation and grace and redemption and righteousness and perfection and love and God's mercy is found and seen and realized only in Jesus. Because you see, he is the Christ, the promised one, the anointed one of God. But please, just as important, grasp that Jesus here is also proclaiming something important. Because it says what? He is the son of the living God. Not a, not a mere man, but God's son. The living God's son. Not a God of our imagination. Not a God of our fancy that we get to manipulate and change at our whim. But we're talking about the true and the living God. The God who created all that was and is and will be. The God who revealed his mercy in his plan of salvation that is given to us in his word. The God who has spoken to us, who has revealed his heart and his love. And I say this because if you don't grasp the marvel of the true and living God, then you can't grasp that God could and God did give us a precise and error-free record and revelation of himself. It's his holy word. This is the living God the eternal being of power and majesty who quietly and absolutely worked his way and will in our world to provide a savior for all who are sinners. That's every one of us. God who has proven himself faithful and true and loving and gracious, so much so that he not only promised but he sent his son. And that's Jesus. Jesus, who is one with the Father. Jesus, who to know is to know the true and the living God, who gave his life and rose again that you might have eternal life. Jesus, the Son of the living God. By the way, as, as I thought about this text and, and all this marvel that's revealed about Jesus, I, I did. I, I got to the point where I kind of wondered, how does Judas fit into here, right? And here's what I'll tell you. Here's what I think. Right now, as of this confession, Judas is in agreement with these words. But as the next year unfolds, if you understand that year of opposition, Jesus begins to teach his disciples what's coming. So as the next year unfolds, Jesus reveals more and more and more about the plan of God for him. And of course, that plan of God for him is that he is going to suffer and die on the cross. Of course, he's going to rise again, but the disciples have trouble with that one. And I think it's because of those things that, that Judas literally is going to end up turning away from Jesus. Judas, within the next year, is going to reject Jesus because of what he was taught as a kid. In other words, he couldn't make that transition. He, couldn't, he, he still wanted Jesus to be an, an earthly ruler and, a, a, and all that stuff. And how sad. How sad. And, and again, an important lesson for all of us to consider. Because again, Judas, Judas had trouble wrapping his mind around this idea of the suffering, dying, atoning sacrifice of Jesus. 
See, Judas, Judas couldn't let go of that desire for earthly status, that Jesus would be a ruler here, that Jesus would make the world a better place, that Jesus would, would be a ruler and overseer of an earthly kingdom. So Judas became focused on worldly things rather than on the spiritual and redemptive work of Jesus. And I think that's why Judas ends up rejecting Jesus. And just a precaution for us, because I think sometimes that's easy for all of us to do. Because the truth of the matter is, life is hard. Lots of struggles in life, difficulties. The world crowds in on us in so many different ways. And if we're not careful, we tend to blame Jesus. There are all sorts of stresses and strains that just run rampant in our lives. And when things aren't going, especially as we desire or hope, you know, when we have all those ups and downs and life is just taking its toll, <laughs> maybe it's just age. Either way, with, without our thinking about it, we, we have a tendency to blame Jesus. We have a tendency to do it this way. We, we think, well, 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 if Jesus really loved me, I mean, if he was really God, if he really cared about me, well, this stuff, this stuff wouldn't be. I wouldn't have any struggles. My struggles wouldn't happen. He would just make my life real smooth. Do people, that's, that doesn't happen. Because we live in a world of sin, and, and without our thinking about it, we, we tend to blame Jesus. Please don't. So when your life is filled with struggles and difficulties and turmoils of all sorts, then please remember to turn to Jesus, to look to him for wisdom and strength and comfort, to hear how Jesus forgives us, to hear how Jesus you know, how the, the troubles of this world and Jesus, well, well, when they're measured against the eternal promises that Jesus gives to us, we're really told that our troubles, our problems are really what? To be considered as nothing. Just temporary problems of this sin-filled world. To hear how Jesus does, does love you. How he has died for your sins and rose from the dead and how he has called you to be his child, an heir of eternal life who has awaiting a mansion in a kingdom of joy and wonder forever. To hear how Jesus will be with you in this world, how he will guide you, how he will strengthen you, how he will carry you if necessary. To hear how Jesus, God's son, calls you to be his eternal brother or sister not only for heaven, but right now. You're a child of God and heir of eternal life. And just understand, his love is there, and his love is true and real, and his redemption, his redemption makes this world a shadowy valley that we are easily going to walk through because the truth of the matter is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, is walking with us. Try to remember, don't, don't blame Jesus, but rather to turn to Jesus for help and wisdom and, and guidance and strength. That's, that's the better thing to do. So then you recognize what it kind of boils down to today is, is to ask yourself the, the very same question that Jesus asked those disciples. But you, who do you say Jesus is? Who, who do you say is your Savior. What is it that you really think and believe about Jesus? And I pray, I pray that your confession is exactly that of the first disciples. You not only say that, but you believe that truth, you cling to that truth. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 